Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 93 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about reincarnation, including the famous case of Bridie Murphy. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. For thousands of years, people in various cultures have believed in reincarnation, the idea that we live a series of lives in different bodies. In some places, like India, the belief is widely accepted. And in the 1950s, the idea of reincarnation burst into the American consciousness in a dramatic way. A Colorado housewife named Virginia Ty underwent a series of hypnotic regressions in which she reported memories of being an Irish woman named Bridie Murphy in the 1800s. This led to a series of articles in popular newspapers and magazines, as well as a book and a major motion picture called The Search for Bridie Murphy. They electrified America and began what is called the Bridie Murphy craze. Many people thought this provided proof of life after death in general and of reincarnation in particular. American culture was profoundly influenced with many new people being open to and even becoming believers in reincarnation. So what is reincarnation? How might it work? And what does the evidence really say? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So Jimmy, this uh, seems to be like it would be a very big topic. How are we going to handle that? This is a kind of foundational episode or really a pair of episodes because reincarnation comes up a lot in different discussions of mysteries and there are a bunch of different beliefs about it. It, There are all kinds of different theories about how it works. We're going to keep this fairly basic for now and we can go into details in future episodes and look at alternative theories and stuff. Uh, We're going to be keeping it fairly basic and we're going to do a two-parter. Uh, right now in here this week in episode 93, we're going to give you uh, some background on the concept of reincarnation and Bridie Murphy. And we're going to look at some of the evidence, but we're going to hit a certain point where we need to continue next week. And so next week, we're going to be looking more at what does the historical record say about Bridie Murphy. And we're also going to be covering the faith perspective next week. And uh, just so we don't keep you waiting for the finale will release the second part on Monday. So you won't have to wait too long to, right. to get that rest of the story for, for you. So uh, we always note when one of us has a connection to a mystery we're examining, uh, what do we have to mention this time? Well, I used to be a believer in reincarnation. Although I was raised Protestant when I was a young child, my family quit going to church when I was six or seven. And so I was basically nominally Protestant after that. And when I was in my teenage years, I became a new ager and adopted belief in reincarnation. It seemed like an exciting possibility where you get to go exotic places and be exotic people. But then I stopped believing in reincarnation, and when I was 20, I had a profound conversion to Christ. Uh, But because of my personal journey, I'm very familiar with the concept of reincarnation and with the evidence that is used to support it, and so that informs these two episodes. So let's back up to the top level and look at the concept of reincarnation itself. So what does it involve? It depends on the view you take. As I mentioned, there are a lot of different ideas about how reincarnation works. The basic idea is that when you die, your soul passes into another physical body. And this can happen over and over again, leading to a series of lives or incarnations. In the theory section, we'll look at different models of how this is supposed to work, and in future episodes, we'll look at additional theories. But in this one, just for reasons of time, we'll be looking at reincarnation as it is popularly understood by most people here in the West. And this involves a series of lives where human beings come back as other human beings who live in successively later historical periods one at a time. In other words, an orderly progression of lives as humans, one after another. If that's the basic idea of reincarnation we'll be looking at, how did it break into popular Western consciousness? 
Through the Bridie Murphy craze, there had always been Westerners who fancied reincarnation. For example, uh, some were members of the Theosophical Society that gathered around Madame Helen Blavatsky, who we will be discussing in a future episode. But it was the Bridie Murphy craze in the 1950s that really popularized the idea. So what happened in the Bridie Murphy case? Back in 1952, there was a man in Colorado named Maury Bernstein, and he was a businessman by trade, but he was also an amateur hypnotist. And he was part of a dance club, so good for him. (laughs) Another member of the dance club was a 36-year-old housewife from Pueblo, Colorado named Virginia Ty. But in the book that he wrote about these events, Bernstein referred to her using the pseudonym Ruth Simmons because she wanted her privacy protected. From having hypnotized Virginia Ty twice before, Bernstein knew that she was capable of achieving deep hypnotic trances. And on November 29th, 1952, so right at the end of the year, Bernstein decided to try an experiment. He had previously regressed subjects to the age of one year and had them talk about what it's like being a baby. And when he did this to Virginia Ty, she had indeed responded and reported memories of being a baby. So now he wanted to go a step further and ask her about what she remembered before her birth into this life. All told, he did six past life hypnotic regressions with her, and he didn't do them all at once. There were months between these, with the last one occurring almost a year later, on October 1st of 1953. But he apparently planned ahead because he tape recorded the sessions from the beginning, and the transcripts are in the book he wrote. On the night of the first experiment, when he regressed her a back to before the time of her birth, she began to report memories of having been this woman named Bridie Murphy. Uh, Who was Bridie Murphy? Reportedly, she was born on December 20th in 1798. She was named after her grandmother, Bridget. Her father was a barrister, and for Americans, that's a lawyer who presents his case in court before the bar. His name was Duncan Murphy, and Bridie's mother's name was Kathleen. She also had a a brother named Duncan. She claimed to have lived in Cork, Ireland, and as a girl, she went to Mrs. Strain's day school. To give you a sample of what the session sounded like, here's an excerpt from the first session where Bridie describes her family. What is your name? Mm -hmm. Bridie. Your name is what? Bridie. Don't you have any other name? Hmm. Heidi Murphy. Where do you live? I live in Cork. And what is the name of your mother? Kathleen. And what is the name of your father? Duncan Murphy. What are you doing now? Hmm. Playing, uh, playing house. Or Playing with my brother. What is your brother's name? Duncan. What is your father's name? Duncan. I see. How old are you when you're playing house with your brother? Eight. What is the name of the country in which you live? Ireland. I see. Now that you are eight years old, do you know what year it is? Well, you don't know what year it is. Eighteen, something. Eighteen oh. Eighteen oh six. Eighteen oh six. Mm-hmm. Where does your father work? Where does your father work? He's a barrister. He's a smart man. At age 17, Bridie met a man named Sean Brian Joseph McCarthy, who was a student in Belfast. She married him in Cork in a Protestant ceremony since she was Protestant, then married Brian again in Belfast in a Catholic ceremony since he was Catholic. Brian became a barrister and taught law at Queen's University in Belfast. According to Bridie, other teachers uh, there included William McGlone, a man named Fitzhugh, and another named Fitzmaurice. Bridie and Brian lived in a cottage behind his grandmother's house on Dooley Road. They went to St. Teresa's Catholic Church, whose priest was named Father John Gorin or Gorman. The transcripts have both names in it. 
Here's an excerpt from the first session where she mentions him. What church do you go to? I go to St. Teresa's. St. Teresa's. Uh-huh. In Belfast. Uh-huh. What is the name of the priest? What is the name of the father? Father John. In another experiment, she said that St. Teresa's was off Dooley Road, quote, on the main way, close quote. In later years, Brian wrote several articles for a newspaper called the Belfast Newsletter, and uh, Bridie died after a fall down the stairs in 1864, after which she withered away. What happened after Bernstein finished his hypnotic experiments with Virginia Tye? It set off a major sensation in American culture known as the Bridie Murphy craze. In 1954, the Bridie story was featured in three articles in a magazine called Empire, which was a Sunday supplement of the Denver Post. The response was enormous, and Bernstein set about writing a book called The Search for Bridie Murphy, which came out in 1956. It was a major bestseller, and it remains in print to this day. Other books on reincarnation, which Bernstein had recommended in his own book, were rushed back into print. Also, in 1956, Paramount Pictures released a film version of The Search for Bridie Murphy as a major motion picture. Record producers started producing songs with titles like Do You Believe in Reincarnation, The Bridie Murphy Rock and Roll, and The Love of Bridie Murphy. Countless other newspapers and magazines also picked up the story, and people started throwing reincarnation-themed costume parties known as -as come-as-you-were parties, so you'd dress up like one of your past lives. At such parties, you might have a drink called a reincarnation cocktail, and if you want to make one for yourself, the recipe was a jigger of vodka and a half-jigger of maraschino liqueur taken with limit shaken with lemon juice and crushed ice and topped with a cupful of flaming rum. I'm not sure what all of those ingredients are, especially the flaming rum, but I'm sure cocktail aficionados will know. It's exactly what you think. It's rum that's been lit on fire. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Needless to say, uh, loads of other people started getting past life regressions and hypnotists were doing booming business. Tragically, a 19-year-old newsboy in Shawnee, Oklahoma, shot himself with a rifle. The note he left said, quote, I am curious about the Bridie Murphy story, so I am going to investigate the theory in person. Uh, so how, yeah. long, how long did the Bridie Murphy craze last? As intense as it was, the phenomenon didn't last that long. William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon that the movie Citizen Kane is based on, didn't like the fact that some rival papers were cleaning up with the Bridie Murphy story, so he did what any media mogul would do, try to stir up a controversy and undermine his competition. A team of reporters from the Hearst paper, The Chicago American, got on the story and produced a series of articles that were syndicated throughout the Hearst paper chain. The reporters had no trouble figuring out that the housewife called Ruth Simmons in The Search for Bridie Murphy was actually Virginia Tighe. Once they knew that, they started investigating her life, and they came back with a devastating expose. When the public read the expose, many concluded that the story had been debunked and the public started to lose interest. Despite that, there are supporters of the Bridie Murphy story down to today. But here's the thing. The Hearst expose was profoundly flawed. When other investigators looked into it, they found that the people the Hearst reporters interviewed would not confirm things that had been attributed to them. They said, I never said that. It looked like this was very much a case of yellow journalism with the reporters stretching the truth in order to please their boss and sell papers. The Hearst expose was so flawed that I won't even be quoting from it here or repeat claims it made in this episode because I don't want people to accidentally remember things from the Hearst report that were false. You know, I don't want to pollute people's memories with stuff we now know to be false. So we won't even be going into the Hearst expose. So what happened to Bernstein and Ty in later years? Bernstein gave up hypnotism and focused on his business, and he passed away in 1999. Ty, who had insisted on hiding her identity under a pseudonym in Bernstein's book, didn't like being in the spotlight, so she largely stayed out of public view. 
But 10 years later, in 1966, she appeared as a panelist on the game show To Tell the Truth on television. And in later interviews, she said that she was personally skeptical of reincarnation. So she was not convinced by the hypnosis session she had undergone. But in later years, she said that as she got older, she'd like it to be true. She finally passed into the great beyond in 1995. So what theories are there about reincarnation? There are basically two overarching theories. First, reincarnation takes place. And second, reincarnation doesn't take place. Beyond that, the theories concern the details of how reincarnation is supposed to work. And here there are a huge number of sub-theories, which involve a number of different topics. One concerns who is subject to reincarnation. It's possible that absolutely everyone reincarnates. But at least in Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, it's held that some people do not reincarnate because they have achieved the needed level of spiritual development to avoid it. In fact, that's the core idea of Buddhism, that by following the Eightfold Path, you can avoid reincarnation into a new life of suffering and can enter the state of nirvana instead. Another topic concerns what you may come back as. According to some, reincarnation involves what in the West is sometimes called the great chain of being. On this view, you could reincarnate into forms that are either very high up the chain of being or very low down the chain of being. You might reincarnate into something as lowly as a microbe or even in some theories uh, into something that even isn't even recognized as being alive or you could come back as a rock. On the other hand, you might be able to reincarnate into something as high as a god. The determining factor will be how well you've lived and what karma you're carrying. Here in the West, though, it's often assumed that you reincarnate as another human. You don't, like, come back as a cockroach or something. But that's not assumed everywhere. It's also not assumed here in the West, it's not assumed that you'll necessarily come back as a human because a third topic deals with the planet you'll reincarnate on. While in the East, it's often assumed you'll reincarnate here on Earth, that's not assumed by everybody in the West. It is sometimes held that you can reincarnate on other planets, in which case you may return as a sentient alien, perhaps a member of the gray species that is described in some UFO accounts. And in fact, there are people here in the West who will say, oh yeah, I used to be a member of this alien race in a past life. A fourth issue deals with the time period in which you'll reincarnate. It's often assumed that you will reincarnate in the future, that your lives progress in an orderly fashion throughout history. In that case, you can remember past lives, such as through hypnotic regression or spontaneous recall, but some hold that you can also have knowledge of your future lives, things you have yet to experience. So you'll, in addition to have hypnotic having hypnotic regressions, you'll also have hypnotic progressions into future lives. When I believed in reincarnation as a teenager, I entertained a related view that if the soul is not bound by time, it could reincarnate either in the past or in the future. So you weren't bound to experience history in any particular order. I also entertained an idea that people are manifestations of a larger entity known as an oversoul. Uh, this is a concept that's out there in New Age literature, the oversoul. In this case, individual souls might be projections of this larger oversoul into individual time periods, in which case an oversoul might have multiple incarnations undergoing individual lives in different time periods simultaneously. So there could be multiple versions of you right now, for example. These would be parallel incarnations in the same time. Finally, it might be possible to reincarnate in different universes. In that case, the events reported in any given life would correspond to the history of that universe, even though they don't necessarily correspond to the history of this universe. Okay. So before we get into addressing the, these through the reason perspective and faith perspective, uh, do you want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Sean L., Susan R., Trevor W., John E., and Robert B., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest, 
And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we also want to remind you that our 100th episode is right around the corner, and we want to make it a special yeah. celebration that includes our listeners. Yeah. The title is Mysterious Celebration, so we're not going to tell you everything that we're going to do on the show, but we do want to get your feedback for it, and so we'd love to hear from you. We've set up a special phone number you can call and leave audio feedback uh, just to make it easy. All you have to do is call a number. The number is, and we'll have the number in the show notes, and we'll repeat it at the end of the show. But the number is 720-295-7776. Once again, that's 720-295-7776. Of course, it's always possible to use the voice memo feature on your phone and then share what you record, but everybody knows how to place a phone call. So we set up a phone number for you. We'll download the audio feedback you give us. Tell us, you know, what you like about the show, what the show has meant to you, how you've used it, uh, how it's affected other people, you know. And uh, we'd love to include feedback from as many folks as we can in the mysterious celebration 100th episode. The number again is 720-295-7776. Excellent. Jimmy, what can we say about reincarnation from the reason perspective? Well, we've laid a huge number of possible variants on the table, and it's too much for us to consider in a single episode. There's no way we could go through all those theories and comment on them. Consequently, we'll deal with many of them in future episodes. For example, I know we'll be looking at the supposed uh, progressions into future lives and how accurate the information they report is or is not. For now... We'll be looking at, as we said, the kind of core standard Western theory of reincarnation, where you return to life in the body of another human at a new point in history, leading an orderly historical progression of lives. So what can we say about the evidence for reincarnation from this perspective? Anybody can claim to be uh, the reincarnation of someone from an earlier period in history. The question is whether there's evidence supporting this claim. and evidence typically is offered in one of three forms under the heading of reason. It could be philosophical evidence, it could be bodily evidence, and it could be mental evidence. So, all right, let's look at the philosophical evidence. What kind of arguments do reincarnation supporters make for their position? Philosophical arguments for reincarnation are often made in Eastern religions. Every religion, including Christianity, has certain philosophical aspects. You know, that's that's why St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, is often discussed in philosophy programs and isn't viewed simply as a theologian. He's also a very important philosopher. The same thing is true in Eastern religions like Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, which all teach reincarnation and make various philosophical arguments for it. Those arguments vary from one religion to another, which makes it hard to treat in a single episode. But the main argument you'll encounter is based on the concept of karma. The basic idea for karma is that every action you do, good or bad, has consequences. So if you do good things in life, good things will happen to you in the future. If you do bad things in life, bad things will happen to you in the future. But human experience shows that some people get away with doing bad things in this life. So reincarnation advocates argue that, well, the bad things are going to happen to them in future lives instead. They, you know, they, there's justice in the world. If you, you did bad stuff and nothing bad happened to you now, it'll happen in a future life. Also, some humans experience bad things in this life even though they haven't done bad things in this life. So reincarnation advocates argue, well, therefore, they must have had previous lives. They did something bad in a previous life, and that's why something bad happened to them in this one, even though we didn't see them do anything bad to deserve it. So karma, coupled with reincarnation, becomes a solution to the problem of evil. If you wonder why some apparently innocent children suffer or die or are born with horrible birth defects or are born into crushing poverty in the third world, it's because they aren't innocent children. They're guilty of grave offenses in past lives, and their present horrible circumstances are simply their just desserts. They're paying off karma for crimes they committed before, but that they can't remember. Anytime anything bad happens to a person, 
it's because he deserves it. The flip side of this is when a person does good things in this life, but good things don't happen to him in return, you know, he'll get them in the next life as, or in a future life, as we mentioned. So how would you evaluate those arguments? With respect to the need for future lives, for people to reap the rewards of their labors, the argument doesn't prove its case. I mean, let's start with the argument's fundamental assumption that the universe is ultimately just, so good deeds will be rewarded. I'm prepared to, to agree with that. I mean, God is in control. He's going to make sure justice happens. So if you do good stuff, you'll be rewarded. The argument's other premise, though, that some humans have a net positive of good deeds versus negative ones is more problematic, but let's grant it for purposes of argument. Even if it's true, all it implies is life after death. It doesn't imply reincarnation. You could get your rewards in a continued disembodied existence. You could get your rewards in a future resurrection. You could get your rewards in a reincarnation. But all it really, all the argument would really prove that, okay, you did something good, but you didn't get rewarded for it in this life, all that proves is future life of some kind. It doesn't prove reincarnation. So what about reincarnation as an explanation for the problem of evil? Critics of reincarnation often argue that the idea is heartless and that it'll have the effect of decreasing human compassion. I mean, do we really want to say that a little girl who is born blind and lame and then gets cancer and dies is actually a horrible criminal who's getting exactly what she deserves based on a past life? Or if a little boy burns to death in a tenement fire, that he's some kind of moral monster who deserved to burn to death? What effect will such views have on us if we hold them? Uh, don't they decrease our own sense of compassion for others if we view them as just getting what they deserve? Something in our basic moral intuitions should tell us there's something wrong with this view. And I think that's right, but I want to focus on some conceptual difficulties with the law of karma. The first thing I want to point out is that karma only works as an explanation for the problem of evil to the extent that it's an ironclad law, meaning that every single bad thing that happens to someone is because of a past bad act. If karma isn't ironclad, then there are bad things that happen which aren't due to bad actions in the past. But if bad things can happen to a person without him being responsible for them, that weakens the case for a past life. Maybe something bad happened to him in this life just because, even though he was innocent, in which case you don't need a past life to explain what happened to him. So to keep the argument for reincarnation as strong as possible, we'll proceed on the assumption that karma is an ironclad law, because if it's not ironclad, you, it just decreases the force of the argument. What conceptual problems do you see with using karma to argue for reincarnation? First, there's the flip side of using it to argue for future lives. Even if an apparently innocent person is suffering in this life, points to him having committed crimes previously, all that implies is a prior life of some kind. You know, just like people who go unrewarded in this life only requires life after death, not reincarnation specifically, so apparently innocent people suffering in this life would only require life before birth, not necessarily reincarnation. A person may have sinned in a prior disembodied existence, and that's why he's suffering now. In fact, that's what some people who believe in the pre-existence of souls have proposed. So the argument from karma wouldn't prove its case. It would only point to prior life of some kind. Second, there's the problem of how the process would even get started. I mean, suppose you're back at the time of the first person to do something bad, the karmic equivalent of Adam. He might have lived in our universe or even in a prior one. It doesn't matter. But prior to him, nobody had done anything bad. And then one day, karmic Adam hauls off and socks somebody in the jaw, causing that person to suffer. Well, karmic Adam thus needs to suffer in return. And if he didn't do so in his original life, he'd need to come back in another so he could get his just desserts. But let's think about the person he just socked. Did that person deserve what he got? If he did, 
then he must have done something bad, in which case Karmic Adam isn't the first person to sin. So he wouldn't be Karmic Adam. And we've got a contradiction. How can Karmic Adam harm somebody without pushing the problem of evil further back? Because that person needed to do something for him to suffer. Or if the person he socked didn't deserve it, then bad things can happen to truly innocent people, in which case the law of karma isn't ironclad and its explanatory power is weakened. Either way, we have a problem for the theory of karma to overcome. Now, you might try to solve that problem by proposing that there was no karmic atom, that the universe has an infinite history with people doing bad stuff all the way back. Or you might try to solve it by proposing time travel, you know, at least involving souls so that we have a temporal spiritual bootstrap paradox. But in both cases, you're just speculating to prop up a theory that's otherwise in trouble. Then there's the problem of justice. I mean, suppose I sock you in the mouth, causing you to suffer. Why is it bad for me to do that? Because under an ironclad version of karma, you're getting what you deserve. If I sock you, it's because you did something, maybe in a past life, and you deserve it. So it appears I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not being bad. I'm being good. I'm actually delivering justice to you. My socking you in the jaw is totally just. But in that case, how does anyone ever do anything wrong? Because anytime anyone causes someone to suffer, it's only because that person deserves it. So how are any person's actions bad? It looks like they're all absolutely just. And in that case, they themselves aren't earning bad karma. So they shouldn't have to come back in new lives and suffer. In fact, nothing bad should ever happen to them because they've never done anything wrong. The ironclad version of karma thus leads to another paradox. And this interlocks with a compassion argument I mentioned earlier. Not only does the idea of karma give us one less reason to be compassionate, it also leads to another paradox. Suppose there are starving children in the street. I can either help them or not. If I don't help them, it's fine, because they're only getting what they deserve. But if I do help them, how do I know I'm not just deferring their suffering? By giving them relief now, I may be interrupting their suffering that they need to have to pay off their karma, in which case they'll just have to suffer more in the future. So I can't tell whether I should help them or not. It's totally fine for me not to help them because ironclad karma will not allow them to suffer more than they should. So I can just sit back and not do anything ever to help anybody, and it's totally just of me. In fact, I can behave in a totally irresponsible manner. I could work in a restaurant and never wash the vegetables I'm serving people. I could be a doctor who never sterilizes the surgical instruments I use. I could go drunk driving every night. And no matter how reckless my behavior is or what the bad effects of it are, it's not a problem because the people that get hurt deserved it. So this seems to rob my actions of moral meaning. And You know, there are other problems with the philosophical arguments for reincarnation as well. Uh, For example, I mean, how are you supposed to learn by experiencing bad things in this life if you can't remember the deeds you committed that deserve them? Also, you know, the law of the argument from karma, frankly, is it's built on a lot of speculation. It requires you to make some major assumptions like karma exists that we don't have proof for. But I think we've said enough to show that there are pretty significant problems with the philosophical arguments for reincarnation from karma. It would be better for reincarnation advocates to try to prove their case by pointing to empirical evidence for reincarnation, either bodily or mental evidence, rather than making philosophical arguments, because the philosophical arguments are shot through with holes. So let's look at the bodily evidence that reincarnation support a site for their view. What do they say? When it comes to bodily evidence, advocates of reincarnation sometimes propose birthmarks and other birth defects. Uh, For example, if a person is missing part of a limb, let's say they don't have a left hand, this may be a sign that someone cut off their left hand in a recent life. Personally, I don't find this argument convincing. I myself have a birthmark. On my right forearm, there are two bright red splotches that are very close together. Sometimes people will notice it and ask me if I burned myself there. But 
those are just places on my skin where there are an unusually large number of capillaries near the surface of the skin. There's no evidence that unusual bunchings of capillaries are caused by anything that happened to me in a past life. I mean, they're just places of abnormal capillary growth that happened to me either when I was in the uterus or early in this life. But there's no obvious way for a past life to have make a bunch of capillaries bunch up in this life. In the same way, other people's birthmarks or birth abnormalities don't have any clear connection to a past life. You can propose past lives as an explanation for them if you want, but that's not the same thing as providing evidence for past lives. There's no clear mechanism for bodily injuries in one life to cause birthmarks or birth defects in this life, so it's just speculation. All right, if we don't look to bodily features as evidence of past lives, what about mental phenomena that are supposed to support it? There are several types of evidence that have been proposed, most of which deal with memories. These memories could be subconscious or conscious. If they're subconscious, then they may still manifest in this life, even though you're not consciously aware of them. For example, a person's inclinations and preferences may be based on things they experienced or learned in a previous life. Thus, if I died of an illness in a previous life, I might come back as a germaphobe or a health nut who is determined to avoid illness at all costs. Or if I learned how to play a musical instrument in a past life, I might come back with an aptitude for music in this life. Some have proposed that musical prodigies like Mozart or geniuses in other fields like Einstein are evidence of reincarnation because they must have learned these skills in a past life. If memories of a past life are conscious, though, you know, the preferences and talents are kind of subconscious memories bubbling through, If but if the memories are conscious, they could either occur spontaneously or have been deliberately retrieved. Thus, some children are held to spontaneously have memories of past lives, you know, where they come to their parent and announce that they're a fighter pilot or something like that. Alternately, a person may deliberately try to recall memories of a past life, like through hypnosis with Bridie Murphy. Another argument that uh, you could make is that some people seem to be helped by what's called reincarnation therapy, where they relive experiences in past lives under hypnosis, and then they get over phobias and psychological quirks. A final category of mental phenomena that's been proposed for reincarnation are psychic readings, where one person is able to discern information psychically about somebody else's past lives. Uh, This was the case, for example, with the famous American psychic Edgar Cayce. He would give past life readings on other people, and we'll definitely be talking about him in the future. All right, let's look at each of these proposed kinds of mental evidence. What do you make of the argument that people's subconscious memories of past lives may manifest in things like preferences or talents in this one? There are several problems here. One is that these things are supposedly learned, like learning to fear dogs because you were menaced by a dog in a past life or learning to play music because you played music in a past life. But if you could learn those things in a past life, why couldn't you just learn them now? I mean, you had to learn them at some point. So why do you need to say they were learned before? Maybe you learned them in this life and just forgot about it. Or maybe you didn't learn them. Maybe one of your ancestors did. Scientists have recently discovered that it's possible to pass down things like phobias through our DNA, which are, and these are sometimes called inherited memories. Uh, What they did to show this was they trained a bunch of mice to fear the smell of a cherry blossom by giving them an electric shock every time they let them smell cherry blossom. So, you know, as soon as the mice smell the cherry blossom, they tense up because they're afraid they're going to get an electric shock. Then they let the mice get busy. And it turned out that the mice's offspring were also afraid of cherry blossom smell, even though they'd never been exposed to it. What was happening was the initial traumatic experience of being shocked whenever they smelled the cherry blossom was epigenetically activating the genes associated with identifying this smell. And the activated genes were then passed on to their offspring in activated form. This is apparently evolution's way of helping the offspring survive in a particular environment. If there's a danger in that environment, like being shocked whenever you smell cherry blossom, the fear 
of that can be passed on to your offspring so that they'll be able to recognize the danger more quickly without having to learn it for themselves. And this may be the explanation for why some people have inborn phobias, uh, because their ancestors were exposed to certain dangers. Also, if something else helped an ancestor survive, like maybe playing a violin, it could activate those genes and they could be passed on in activated form to their descendants. So it's problematic to propose things like phobias and, ta and talents for this. Also, because these are really intangible things. I mean, it's not like even if you have a phobia or a talent, it's not like you can prove that you were a specific individual in the past who had this particular kind of learning experience. So it's it's really speculative. These things are also subject to natural explanations that don't require reincarnation. Some people, for example, even if it's not an inherited memory epigenetically like we were talking about, some people are just wired to have certain preferences and talents. And there's often a genetic component to that, like when identical twins who are raised apart later meet in life and have startling behavioral similarities. For example, here's an account of two such twins from CBS News. Jim Lewis and Jim Springer were identical twins raised apart from the age of four weeks. When the twins were finally reunited at the age of 39 in 1979, they discovered that they both suffered from tension headaches, were prone to nail biting, smoked Salem cigarettes, drove the same type of car, and even vacationed at the same beach in Florida. These kinds of eerie similarities are thought to be due to subtle genetic influences. And some people's brains are just wired a certain way, you know, such as to be really, really smart, which can account for prodigies and geniuses in particular fields. Consider Einstein. He was a genius in physics, but he was born in 1879. So any past lives he had would have occurred before 1879, and that meant physics was in a much less well-developed state. The physics concepts that he excelled in couldn't have been discovered before his birth, so he couldn't have learned them before his birth. And that points to him just being a really smart guy. He was born in a certain age when there was rapid progress in the field of physics. He took the concepts discovered after he was born and pushed them further. He wasn't remembering these from a prior age when these concepts were unknown. What about spontaneous memories of past lives, like when a small child suddenly announces that he was a fighter pilot? One problem here is that children play a lot of fantasy games. A small child, upon learning about fighter pilots, may easily play games where he fantasizes about being one, and he may then come to his parents and announce, I'm a fighter pilot, or... I'm a cowboy, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a scientist. And if his parents, or the psychologists or religious figures they consult, are advocates of reincarnation, the child may be told this is an actual memory. And since children are biologically programmed to accept what they're told by adults, he may conclude this is a memory. And even if the child wasn't playing a game, maybe he dreamed one of these things. You know, I mean, he could have dreamed he was a fighter pilot. Like everybody who remembers their dreams, I know I occasionally have a hard time remembering whether something I dreamed was a dream or something that happened in real life. And, you know, I'll have to stop and think, wait, did that really happen or did I just dream that? And the same thing can happen to kids, in which case the kid would also report what happened in a dream as if it were a real memory. So... Without looking at the historical record and seeing if such a person actually existed, that wouldn't prove anything. What about past life memories that are deliberately recovered under hypnosis? The problem here, as we discussed in episode 52 on hypnosis, is that hypnosis is not a magical memory aid. In fact, it is very much not to be trusted, which is why the competent authorities no longer use it in criminal trials or to recover memories of childhood abuse. It is just too unreliable. In a hypnosis session, a person is encouraged to imagine a past event and is then encouraged to regard it as a genuine memory. That's a recipe for confabulation and the creation of false memories, as we discussed. Without verification from the historical record, such memories are not to be trusted. What about the idea that some people are helped by reincarnation therapy 
where people relive events from their past lives and then get over psychological hangups. Back when I was in my teens, I read several books of psychological case studies of people who underwent reincarnation therapy. One of the things I realized in hindsight is that all these accounts were anecdotal. They were just individual case studies. They were not scientific studies where you systematically survey a large group of people using control groups and testing alternative hypotheses. They weren't rigorously testing. These were just, oh, I, I treated this patient and here's what happened. So they're just stories. They're not scientific studies. Even more than that, though, one of the things I remember the books themselves saying is that this didn't really provide proof of reincarnation, but they would justify the book and the therapy on other grounds. They would say things like, well, even if reincarnation is not true, isn't it good that these people are being helped with their psychological hangups? You know, it doesn't so much matter is this really true or not, but it helps people. As if that justified leading people to believe something that wasn't true. And there are also good reasons why such studies should not be presented as proof. Because known psychological mechanisms can account for the therapeutic benefit that these individuals got. First, reliving an experience and realizing you were not hurt by it is a standard way of desensitizing patients and helping them overcome their phobias. It's a standard part of cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, let's say you're afraid of spiders. Well, you go to a cognitive behavioral therapist. They'll have you learn about spiders so that you can think about them rationally. They may simulate being in a room with plastic spiders. Then they may have you interact with actual spiders. And when you realize that you haven't been hurt by these experiences, your fear of spiders diminishes. In the same way, if your past life therapist tells you that you're afraid of dogs because you were menaced by one in a past life, and then you're put under hypnosis so you can re relive that experience and yet realize you're not hurt by it in this life, your fear of dogs may decrease. Similarly, we need to take into account the role of the placebo effect. Even if we aren't dealing with desensitization, as in the previous example, the mere fact of being presented with some kind of explanation for your hang-up may help. If you're told, well, you have this hang-up because of something that happened in your past life, and if you're then told, don't worry, you can move past it now, that's the equivalent of being told that your disease is caused by germ XYZ, but don't worry, therapy ABC will cure you. It doesn't matter if germ XYZ is imaginary and therapy ABC is just a sugar pill. The fact you believe that this therapy will help you feel better will cause you to feel better just by the placebo effect. So once again, without verification from the historical record, reincarnation therapy wouldn't provide proof of reincarnation. What about when a psychic gives a person a reading and reports details of that person's past lives? It's the same thing. Uh, without confirmation from the historical record, we have no evidence that the psychic isn't simply making up the information or imagining it. You keep focusing on the value of confirmation from the historical record. What would it mean if a person's memories, either spontaneously or hypnotically recalled, or if a psychic's readings did confirm details of a reported past life? This would count as evidence that would provide at least some support for reincarnation, which thus far we haven't had. Even in this case, though, it wouldn't automatically provide proof from the reason perspective. Why not? Well, in the first place, there's the possibility that someone is faking the whole thing, you know, hoaxing it. After all, there have been hoaxers in every age of human history, and you need to provide evidence that I'm not one of them, that I didn't research this matter, whether I'm the person undergoing hypnosis or whether I'm a psychic telling someone about their past lives. You need to show that I didn't research this matter and bone up on historical details. So that kind of checking can be done, at least to some degree of probability, but it would be a necessary first step in the process of authentication. You need to know you're not dealing with a hoax. Another thing you'd need to eliminate is the fact that some people make lucky guesses about the past, sometimes based on background knowledge. I mean, for example, if I reported a past life memory where I was a Catholic clergyman in Ireland and nothing else, that wouldn't prove much because there have been lots of Catholic clergymen in Ireland. Random chance in my or my imagination, you know, might produce that. You need verifiable details that could not be guessed by random chance. 
Also, you need to provide evidence that my knowledge of the reported past life isn't natural. Uh, I may, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier, I may have been exposed to the knowledge and simply forgotten it. This is a phenomenon known as cryptoamnesia, and it occurs all the time. For example, if I asked you when you first learned the meaning of the word stop, you'd almost certainly be unable to tell me when you first learned the meaning of stop. I mean, you know what it means, but you're, you learned it in early childhood and you don't remember that. And if you, by some freak chance, do remember when you learned stop, I'm sure there are lots of other words you don't remember learning the meaning of, even though you know them. So in the same way, you may remember details of a supposed past life, maybe because you read a book about Ireland as a little kid or something, and you just don't remember reading that book. Finally, even if you did not have this knowledge previously, there's still a way from within the reason perspective that you might acquire it. If it turned out that psychic abilities are real, you might learn it through them. That is, even though you think you're remembering a past life, what you're actually doing is psychically learning about someone from the past. You might, for example, be remote viewing that person, you know, clairvoyantly observing them in the past. Or if someone else knows this information, you might be picking it up from them. I mean, maybe you're reading the thoughts of the experimenter or a librarian somewhere who happens to know this information. In a truly scientific experiment, these possibilities would need to be controlled for. So how scientific were Bernstein's hypnotic experiments with Ty? They certainly weren't rigorous. For example, here is what he said to take her back before her birth in this life. Notice how much he's leading her. There is no doubt in his mind that she will be able to remember a past life. I mean, he tells her she will. He even notes that this may seem surprising to her, and but he tells her to focus on the images that come into her mind and report them back. So he's totally encouraging her to imagine or fantasize and then report back the content of what she's imagining. I want you to keep on going back and back and back in your mind. And surprising as it may seem, strange as it may seem, you will find that there are other scenes in your memory. There are other scenes from faraway lands and distant places in your memory. I will talk to you again. I will talk to you again in a little while. I will talk to you again in a little while. Meanwhile, your mind will be going back, back, back and back until it picks up a scene until, oddly enough, you find yourself in some other scene, in some other place, in some other time. And when I talk to you again, you will tell me about it. You will be able to talk to me about it and answer my questions. And now just rest and relax while these scenes come into your mind. So all of that leading is really bad from a scientific perspective. On the other hand, we really need to give Maury Bernstein credit for several things in this area. First, he recorded his sessions with Virginia Ty and provided the transcripts in his book. That makes it much easier to compare the Bridie Murphy story to the historical record. Second, he really wanted this kind, of this kind of investigation to be conducted, and he repeatedly asked her about things that could be verified or falsified. During the sessions, he even told her that we're looking for information that could be checked against the historical records. He was totally upfront about that. Third, as we'll see next episode, he even tried to trick her into contradicting herself to see if her story held together. I can't think of another case in the popular press where a reincarnation researcher tried to make that kind of verification or falsification possible. So good on Maury Bernstein. I mean, he wasn't a rigorous scientist, but he really was trying to set this up in a way that it could be checked. So that makes the Bridie Murphy experiments an unusually good test case. So in our next episode, we'll look at what the historical record says and how well what Virginia Ty reported under hypnosis stacks up against it. All right. So uh, before we get to the next episode, uh, Jimmy, what further resources are we going to offer to the listeners on this topic? Well, first, we'll have a link to Maury Bernstein's book, The Search for Bridie Murphy. Uh, we'll also have a link to a DVD I did on the problem of evil to give you a Christian perspective on the problem of evil. 
We'll have Wikipedia's article on Bridie Murphy. We'll have episode 52 on the mystery of hypnosis, so you can go back and listen to that. We'll also have articles on the great chain of being and birthmarks. And I'll also, just so you can see my birthmark, we'll have a photo of me showing it to you. So it's like, okay, this didn't come from a past life. This is just a birthmark. Also, we'll have that CBS News story on twins raised apart, the placebo effect, childhood amnesia. We'll have several pieces on that. Also on make-believe and imaginative play among children. And then we'll have a couple of uh, stories about those inherited memories I mentioned, like where the mice were afraid of cherry blossom smell, even though their parents had been the ones that were exposed to it. All right. So uh, you folks can get started on checking out that uh, those further resources before the next episode. So let's talk about some mysterious feedback we've gotten from listeners. This time, uh, the feedback is mainly on the uh, America's Dyatlov Pass incident or the boys from Yuba City, uh, which we did recently. Sam R. on Patreon writes, uh, personally, I think some combination of theories two and three is plausible. One or more of the men could have witnessed a crime taking place at the game, prompting Gary Mathias to use his force of personality to get the others to pursue the criminals, supposedly to bring them to justice. Once in the mountains, they abandoned the car in pursuit and the deaths played out like in the other theories. And then uh, Sam adds, I'm a big fan of the show and a new patron. Stay curious and please do an episode on the Black Death. And then I want to add a a follow-up. I got a a follow-up message who said, uh, Hi, Dom, this is Sam's dad. Sam's 11 years old, and your show is really strengthening his faith. Thank you. Excellent. That's That's great. That's so so awesome. Yeah, 11-year-old patron. That is wonderful. And a very intelligent one, too, because he's he's got an interesting theory about maybe they saw a crime at the game, and then Gary Mathias used his force of personality to get the others to pursue the criminals, and... That just got him into trouble. So uh, the interesting theory. And thank you so much, Sam. Thank you for your feedback and your patronage. And I've got the Black Death on the list of future topics. Yes. Uh, and I think Sam uh, qualifies as our youngest patron yet. So Yay. <laughs> Aaron Wood writes on YouTube, with regards to Gary Mathias, I'm surprised that no one mentioned the possibility that he was one of the long term survivors, did not mention, did not have his medication with him in the cabin and then slowly became disordered and psychotic as his meds lost effect. I think Gary Mathias was likely one of the long-term survivors, and it is possible that he was on his meds at the time, but then since he obviously didn't have them with him, got more and more disordered as his schizophrenia asserted itself without them. Lee H. writes by email, uh, I think it's more mysterious than Dyatlov Pass. Seems like a lot more twists and turns to this tale and theories as to what happened. Unfortunately, I think it was the man with schizophrenia. I liked what you said about saying a prayer for people in that situation or a similar predicament. I'll be making this a new habit. My question is, did the police try to check phone records from that phone booth? I'm about your guy's age and definitely remember pay phones, and I'm pretty sure that records were kept on phone calls. So, uh, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you're picking up the habit of praying for people in similar situations. I always try to do that whenever I'm praying for something because I realize... If someone here needs my prayers in this situation, there are going to be people in in the same situation elsewhere I don't know about. So I try to pray for them. In terms of the the payphones, yeah, I definitely remember payphones. There's even that moment in the 1978 Superman film where Clark Kent uh, is running down the street. He needs to change into Superman and he looks over at a payphone, which is no longer a phone booth. Yes. And it's funny if you grew up in that time, but these days cell phones. I can imagine some young folks wouldn't even know what that joke is about. (laughs) So yeah, payphones were a definite thing then. What I don't know is how easy it would have been to check, to to trace a particular call. You, If you remember this era, you'll also remember all those movies and TV shows where they're, the police are trying to trace a call and they've got to keep the person on the phone line for so many minutes because they weren't automatically capturing all of that data the way they do today. And so I don't know what kind of records they would have had on a payphone after the fact that would be checkable, especially if it wasn't a long distance call. If it was just a local area call, there might not have been a record of it. I Unfortunately, I don't have any further specific information about that, but they may not have had the ability to check, especially if it was just a local call. But back in the day when local calls were 
common and long distance calls were rare and you had to pay special for them, which we don't have to do anymore. Elizabeth S. writes by email, I'm curious about the cabin that was stocked with food and was capable of having heat. Who owned it? Why was it there? Why was it stocked with that much food? Was it a home for someone or just a getaway type of cabin for hunting? Did the owner ever come back to find people staying there? It was like a trailer that was run by the Forestry Service, if I recall correctly. It was like stationed there for when they needed forestry workers out in the field. And it was kind of permanently stocked and set up for them so they could just come in and do what they needed to do. Kathy S. on Facebook writes, this one was heartbreaking. Those poor boys. I keep thinking of the one who was in the trailer so long without being able to eat any of that food. Yeah, it is very sad. One thing that, for what it's worth, he would not have suffered that much, at least not from hunger. One of the things you find out when you start doing fasting is your body adjusts. It, it's it, There will be some hunger at the beginning when you're when you're at the times you're used to eating hunger is basically learned it's it's a learned reflex so when we're used to getting food is when our body says hey food is normally available now let's turn on the hunger signal but if you don't give into that for a few days your body says okay i guess food is no longer available at this time we may not as we we may as well start burning the fat we have as reserve fuel and not bug him with the hunger signal so actually once you get into fasting mode your body has a fuel source and you won't experience substantial hunger and in fact it was not starvation that uh killed him it was another condition so uh, as much as he may have suffered it wasn't from hunger, so he he didn't have that after the first few days in in any significant amount. Well, thank you, everyone, for your mysterious feedback. I greatly appreciate that. Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines? We have a great story. The headline itself is awesome. NASA fixes Mars lander by telling itself to hit itself with a shovel. <laughs> so <laughs> is they they had a, one of the Mars landers has this device called a mole that was supposed to dig into the Martian surface, but they didn't anticipate how clunky, uh, how clumpy the dirt was. And so the mole got stuck. And so after trying to find various ways to retract the mole and get it out of out of where it was stuck, they finally had the lander hit itself with a shovel and that did the trick. <laughs> Excellent. Also, we'll have a link to a new article on how carbon dating refinement may change history in the sense of as our carbon dating techniques have improved, they've gotten more precise. And now there's some new data that may substantially improve carbon dating. And that will mean that historians may need to move some events around by a few decades in when they thought they happened. And that's a, a good thing. I'm glad carbon dating is getting more accurate. There have been issues with carbon dating that affect some of the mysteries that appear that we will be discussing on the show, like when the biblical exodus occurred. There's some evidence that the carbon dating in th in the ancient Near East is slightly different than the carbon dating in Europe. And if you apply European carbon dating standards to the ancient Near East, it may produce wrong results. And that's what this article deals with. Originally, all the carbon dating calibrations were based on Europe, and now they're finding, oh, it, it, trees in other parts of the world didn't necessarily suck up carbon at exactly the same rate. And so we need to account for it by region. Excellent. Interesting. All right. So before we get to our second episode coming up next week on reincarnation, we want to hear from you about your theories on reincarnation, especially uh, given what Jimmy has told us today. And you can do that. You can send us that information by visiting sqpn.com slash mysterious or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of Mysterious Feedback. So, Jimmy, our next episode, of course, is... Reincarnation Part 2. We'll be looking specifically at what the historical record has to say about Bridie Murphy's claims, and we will also be looking at reincarnation from the faith perspective. All right. And uh, we want to remind you that we're looking for your feedback on our Episode 100 celebration, a Mysterious Celebration. 
which you can send to us by calling and leaving a voicemail at 720-295-7776. And uh, we want to hear from you, like we said, we want to hear from you on anything you want to say about the show and how it has impacted you, how it's affected your life, or uh, how you've shared it with others. We want to hear it all. So again, that's 720-295-7776. Uh, and, uh, of course, we'll have all of the links to the, the resources and uh, the least the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Uh, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. They're, they're all there on one page in one place for you to do all of your shopping and anything you buy there. Help support StarQuest and helps the show continue. So until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.